Hello, everybody. If we could take our seats, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. We'll get started. Uh, good morning. My name is Mark Mullaney, and we've taken the first step toward turning action into accomplishment. VOTF is honored to have Marie Collins with us today to share her insights and experiences. Marie, born in Dublin, Ireland, was a victim of sexual abuse as a child in the 60s. She has campaigned for protection of children and justice for survivors for many years. Marie has also campaigned for a better understanding of the effects of sex abuse on children. She was founding member of the Irish Depression Support Group, AWARE, in 1985 and set up their voluntary helpline, which she ran for many years. Marie helped the Archdiocese of Dublin set up their child protection service in 2003, and also that year became a founding trustee of the advocacy and counseling support group for abuse survivors called One in Four Ireland. In 2010, Marie was recipient of the Humber Summer School Award for Courage. And in March 2014, Pope Francis appointed Marie to his commission on, on setting sex abuse policy and to advise the church on the best practices to protect children. Following Marie's presentation, there'll be a question and answer session, so please keep your questions concise and to the point so that we can squeeze in as many as possible. Will you please give a warm voice of the faithful welcome to Marie Collins. I'm going to start by speaking a little about myself, just to tell you who I am, how I came to be where I am, and then I will bring to you some detail about the commission, how it works, who's on it, what they do, and go on then to speak a little bit about uh, the positives and negatives, the frustrations, the way we're working, um, and the hopes we have uh, of this commission being um, a success, which I think we all hope it, it will be. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, Voice of the Faithful for asking me here today to speak. I've followed the work of Voice of the Faithful since your inception, and uh, it has almost always impressed me, and uh, I think you do wonderful work uh, along the way, and as you've developed covering more and more. Um, but I think I, I just start uh, and say a little bit about myself. Um, in 1960, I know it's a, it's a long, long time ago, and it, it gives away my age, but um, in 1960, I went into hospital as a child. Uh, it was my first time away from home. I was very nervous. I was very scared. Uh, but there was a priest chaplain of the hospital who took me under his wing, uh, took an interest in me. Um, my mother was delighted because she thought this nice priest was going to look after me. Um, unfortunately, uh, he was an abuser. And um, I'm sorry, I forgot to do this. Uh, he, photography was part of his, uh, part of his abuse. Uh, he took this particular photograph here. I was in hospital for a, um, osteomyelitis. I'd had an operation on my arm. I was I had just turned 13. Um, he took many. He took other photographs as well that were uh, indecent, uh, abusive images. Um, when I when I left hospital, I'd gone into hospital a very very uh, confident, happy child. Uh, when I came out, I was a very different child. I worried. He was going to send the photographs to my parents. He was going to send the photographs to my school friends, and I also worried about the fact that everything that had happened was my fault, and I very much didn't want anybody to know about it. I think this is a very common story that you will all be familiar with. Um, I thought it was something about me that had caused the abuse, bad person, uh, and I just didn't want people to know how bad I was. So I. I withdrew into myself completely. I, I turned away from my friends, I turned away from my family, um, and I became very withdrawn. And uh, I suppose in those days, people didn't pay a lot of attention. I suppose it was looked on maybe that I was just going through teenage years or something, but uh, 
I didn't mix socially with my peers. I, I just became a very lonely, very introverted child. By the time I was 17, uh, I began to suffer from severe anxiety. Um, no one knew why, and nobody really needed, tried to find out why, but at that age I started on medication. Uh, for my anxieties. And this began a 30 years of severe um, depression episodes, severe anxiety, a number of years of agoraphobia where I couldn't leave my house. Um, I was uh, unable to work, unable to hold down a career of any sort because of my um, regular admissions to psychiatric hospitals for my severe depression. Um, I was very lucky in that... Uh, I met a man who, um, despite all my problems, although he knew nothing about the abuse, um, asked me to marry him, and, and we married in, in my late 20s. And that's Ray, he's sitting here. We're now 39 years married. Um, and I've got to say, and for those years, we had a son, and for those years, he had to be mother and father, and he also had to put up a, a, a great deal of difficulty with me because from day to day, he didn't know whether I was going to be um, just a bundle of tears or I was going to be sitting in a corner unable to function. Um, life must have been extremely difficult, and I often thought they would both be happier without me. Uh, but he was always there for me, and uh, I hope you don't mind, but I'd like to take this opportunity to publicly thank him. Say I love him very much. And um, thank you. Without him, I don't think I would, would be here today. And I, I think maybe survivors, uh, sometimes those around them and the families, it's not really realized how much they are affected and how much their lives are affected. Uh, I had a lot of psychiatric treatment, but it wasn't until 25 years after the abuse that I was sent to a psychoanalyst and uh, the abuse came up. I had no idea that all these problems with anxiety and panic attacks and depression were anything to do with what had happened to me as a child. But this psychoanalyst recognized that it was. And he began to get me beginning to feel that it hadn't been my fault. And he said I should report it to the church. So I had told only two people at that time, the doctor and, and Ray. And I went to a curate in my parish. And uh, he was a curate I thought who would be sympathetic. He was someone I got along with very well. Um, and I've got to say, although I was abused by a priest, it had not affected my faith in any way. I was a practicing Catholic all those years because to me it was nothing to do with the Catholic Church. It was all about me. But I went to this curate and I, I went to tell him what had happened. And um, I was very nervous and uh, in quite a state, as you can imagine. Um, I told him what had happened, and he immediately told me not to name my abuser because he said, if you name him, I'll have to do something about it, and I don't think there's any need. He then followed that with, it was probably your fault anyway. And the real kicker was, you're forgiven now, you can forget about it. At that point, I think it was like glass shattering. I think my whole being just crumbled into very small pieces. And I left not angry. I left feeling I was right all the time. It was my fault. I went back to the doctor, said, everything's fine. Nothing more need be done. I've reported it and everything. And I was silent for another 10 years. I never spoke to another soul. Unfortunately, during those 10 years, I had more psychiatric treatments, I had more hospitalizations. Um, I had more years of feeling I wasn't functioning as a mother or a, or a wife. I had more of the guilt. And also, what I didn't know at the time, my abuser was still abusing during those 10 years. In 1995, 
uh, we had a, a very high profile case in the press in Ireland and that was the Brendan Smith case. He also abused here in America, I believe. And it was only at that point I realized that a little bit about abuse uh, and child abuse and, and a thought struck me that my abuser might have abused somebody else. That was the very first time I'd even thought about that, 35 years after the abuse. And I decided I had to do something about it. So I contacted the hospital where my abuse occurred and I contacted my diocese. And as a Catholic all my life, I had no doubt whatsoever in my mind that the church was going to be shocked. They were going to want to, to protect the children in this man's di uh, parish. They were going to believe me. I mean, I, I had no doubts about that at all. But of course, the truth was very different. The reality was different. The hospital immediately treated me with great care. They offered me counseling. They uh, reported to the police immediately and um, in every way supported me. My diocese were entirely different. Uh, this priest was still in his parish and um, they wouldn't take him out of his parish. And in fact, he was mentoring the 12 and 13 year olds in the school for their confirmation. Just the age group that he particularly preferred. I was told by the Archbishop who I met that um, there was nothing on his file. He'd never been reported for anything before. And was I sure I wanted to go ahead with this as I might have to go to court and maybe that would be too much for me. And it was a long time ago and, you know, you've heard all these things before. Um, and the main problem was that uh, he couldn't take him from his parish because by doing that I was going to ruin his good name. This was the first time I'd heard that phrase, you can't ruin his good name. Um, of course, I heard it many times after that and, and we've all heard it many times after that. It, they refused to cooperate with the police and, and a police officer who was dealing with my case was very frustrated because they would not cooperate. They eventually, the, the diocese told me he had admitted the abuse, but they still wouldn't cooperate with the police. Eventually, it took two years. Um, it took two years to get my abuser to court uh, and, and uh, he was convicted because I had that photograph that I showed you earlier, which helped towards his, his conviction. Um, but the, the fact that I was assaulted by a priest as a child, he had told me he was a priest, he couldn't do anything wrong. And as a child of the 50s, that to me rang absolutely true. Uh, and that was why, partly why I thought it was all my fault. Um, I had never, had any doubt in my faith or my church. But after two years coming face to face with my diocese and with their attitude and with their wanting to put the good name of this priest above the safety of the children in his parish, I was totally disillusioned and, and my trust was destroyed. <clears throat> my case was at the time one of the oldest <clears throat> ever, ever um, brought in the state. It was only 1997. And the abuse was in 1960. But the clock on the statutes of limitations only began to tick when I realized I had been harmed, which was in 1985. It turned out after that that this priest had abused children in all the decades, the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s. And it was on his file. My abuse was on his file. They knew about his abuse, of, <clears throat> his abuse of the children in the hospital within months of it happening, yet they did nothing about it and they didn't tell the hospital. Um, he has since been convicted in court of, of serious sexual assaults on little girls, as I say, in the 70s, 80s and 90s. He's been jailed three times. He's still alive. He was only a year after the seminary when he abused me. He's still a priest. Um, but what... What really, um, I received counseling at that point. There had been so many losses in my life. We had a son, but I think I would have had more family had I been capable of looking after them. 
Um, I couldn't hold down a job. I, I never held down any sort of a career. Um, and I spent most of my life just trying to get through the day from day to day. I had two years of counselling and the world changed for me. Um, I came to a point in counselling where I felt I can keep looking back and saying, what if this hadn't happened? My life would have been so different. I could go on being bitter, I could get angry, and I felt, <clears throat> I just came to the point of feeling, well, if I do that, that's going to ruin what's left of my life. Bitterness and anger will do nothing but ruin what years I have left. And I made a conscious decision to forgive my abuser, move on with my life, and enjoy every day that I could from then on. It didn't mean that I didn't feel the same about my, my diocese. Um, during the time I was, was struggling to get them to uh, cooperate with the police and tell the truth, because they lied to me on many occasions, I mean, telling me there was nothing on his file when they had a whole history. Um, this Brendan Smith case was in, in the press, and the church leadership in Ireland were making statements daily, saying, we're following our church guidelines to the letter. Our safety guidelines are followed to the letter. Uh, our pastoral care of, of survivors are being followed to the letter. And I knew this was a total and absolute divergence to what was actually happening. There was an enormous difference between what they were saying and what I knew was happening because it had happened to me. And I worried that other survivors were going to be treated in the same way. And also that abusive priests would be left in parishes rather than damage their good name as they tried to do with mine. So I decided I had to go public. And I obviously, I was in my 40s at this time and I was worried about going public because you, I, I hadn't seen anyone go public before. I had no idea how it would affect family, friends, what, um, what people's attitude would be to me. But I felt it was important that people knew what they were being told by their leadership was not what was happening. Um, one of the things I said when I did go public was that the Archbishop, in conversation with me, had said, he didn't have to follow the church guidelines because they had no power in civil or canon law. He could ignore them. And as I say, in public, they were saying they were being followed to the letter. So I made this statement um, public, that the archbishop had said this, that he didn't have to follow them. He could ignore them. And the diocese put out uh, briefings to the, the press saying I was lying. It had never happened and it had never been said and I was simply making it up. <clears throat> and there'd been a very young priest with me at the time. He was supporting me, a priest from my parish, a really wonderful young man. And he went public to confirm that it had been said, he had been present and he had heard it. And I think as you can imagine, his career was very negatively affected by that. He came out to support the survivor when he should have stayed loyal to the church. And he stuck with the church for the next 10 or 15 years, but unfortunately at this point now he has left and they've lost an extremely good man. But I will never forget his courage because it took a lot of courage at the time. Um, as time went on, uh, I lobbied uh, for the setting up of a statutory inquiry into the Dublin Diocese because I knew I was not the only case. There were other cases and I began to meet people. And we lobbied for statutory inquiry because we felt there was no point in having any other type of inquiry. It had to have the power of law. And we did get it. We had meetings with the government and uh, they worked with us and we got the Murphy Commission. And the Murphy Commission was set up uh, and I don't know, some of you are probably familiar with it, but it came out and concluded that the church and the diocese had been preoccupied with protecting itself from scandal rather than protecting children from abuse. And it vindicated 
everything I had said about my case and everything others had said about their cases. It vindicated the, uh, the survivors. But we'd been treated as liars. We'd been treated as just angry people looking for money. Uh, the church had treated it all as just a media event and it would all go away. I think this is Ireland, but I think it's no different here. <laughs> I think you, you recognize all that. Um, <laughs> people then said, well, why would you work with the church? I had at that time stopped practicing my religion. I just couldn't walk into a Catholic church. Um, because one of the things the Archbishop had said to me, which I think had the most impact, I said to him when I found out that they knew my abuser was guilty, I said, how can you know he's guilty, not cooperate with the police, let me go into a court with just my word against his and you know he's guilty? I said, where's the morality in that? And it was his answer that floored me. His answer was, it has nothing to do with morality. I have to follow my legal advice. And I thought, for the last nearly 50 years, I've been leading my life according to what men like this tell me I should do and how I should do it. And now meeting it up close, I hear something like this. Um, it completely devastated me. And I, I could not go into a church and listen to a priest um, on the altar giving a sermon telling me how I should lead my life and, and the morally right thing to do, when in my mind was the thought that those at the top felt they could ignore morality. Um, but on the other hand, I felt if children were being harmed, and nobody uh, was making any changes to, to make it, it better, then those of us had been through it probably knew better than most what was needed. I was invited by the new archbishop, who was Dermot Martin, he's still there, uh, to assist in setting up the Child Protection Office. And I've got to say, he was an entirely different man. The first archbishop, when the inquiry was set up, he went to the High Court to stop his files being opened. Uh, uh, Dermot Martin came in and he handed all the files over to the Commission without exception. Uh, by the way, the original Archbishop was then made a Cardinal. <laughs> Archbishop Martin is still an Archbishop. Um, so he invited me to help set up the Child Protection Office and I did, I got involved with the diocese, but um, it was a difficult, difficult situation because, I mean, one of the reasons I did was because the church were claiming at the time they were on a learning curve and didn't know anything about abuse. And I thought, well, if an, a survivor gets involved and educates them on it, they can never use that defense again. Mind you, I didn't believe it for a minute, but anyway, you know, you can, <laughs> you can, you, you know, uh, you still have to make it difficult for them to use, the, the, uh, use that argument. And also, much more can be achieved by being inside than uh, being outside. I mean, I really think you, you can achieve more by being inside the walls talking than being outside the walls shouting at the gate. You have more chance of being heard. And if you're not heard, then it's the fault of the listeners, not your fault. Working on setting up the Child Protection Office was um, difficult. There was a lot of resentment among the clergy in the diocese. Uh, they didn't like and resented a survivor being involved with setting up the office because they saw the survivor as being the cause of their problems um, and didn't see that they, they needed anyone from the outside. They knew how to do it. Uh, I ploughed on anyway because uh, all you can do with an attitude like that is uh, prove that you know what you're talking about and prove that you can contribute and ignore the, uh, the resentment and the, uh, the coldness that you're being shown. 
Um, in 2003, I was invo invited to join a committee which was writing a new set of guidelines for the whole country. Ireland, as you know, is unusual in that it's really two countries, the UK part in the north and the Republic in the south. But this was a set of, the, the church is actually united. Um, and I was asked to work on a committee that was writing the new guidelines. And it was 50-50, lay, lay and, and clerical, religious. Um, and it was to write a whole new set of guidelines which would have strength and power. Um, and it again was a huge learning experience because despite the devastating effects of the abuse crisis on the Irish church, and the, the objective evidence of how wrong past practices had been, there was still an entrenched view in some of the clerical people on that committee that most of the problem was due to the media and it would be wrong to curtail the powers of the bishop to do as he wished in his diocese. In other words, if he didn't want to report, he shouldn't be made, etc. There was quite a struggle between the clerical people and the, the lay people on that. Uh, some very, there was a couple of very good priests on it who were absolutely excellent. One in particular who kept standing up with the uh, lay child protection people and agreeing with them. And another religious member of the committee reported him to his bishop for disloyalty to the church. Um, but that was a big learning curve for me because I began to realize how things work uh, inside uh, a clerical, that clericalism works. Out of the struggle, eventually a document did come and uh, it was presented to the sponsoring bodies, the, the leadership in the church, and they turned it down. They said it was too prescriptive. They wanted it weakened and loosened up. And many of us on the committee refused because it was a good document. And we resigned. And the document was finished by some church people. And it was published. And when it was published, it was published and it was announced it had been written and approved by the entire commission. I went public on that. I haven't been too popular with the church, you know. <laughs> but I, I wasn't going to let them away with this because it wasn't written by us, and it wasn't approved by us. And uh, I made it clear in, in the press exactly how the provenance of the document. As it turned out, it had to be withdrawn quite soon afterwards because it was so weak, it didn't even live up to the civil law in the country. <laughs> so it, it just had to be withdrawn. Um, and we could have told them that. But sometimes when you're working with the church, I mean, this attitude, and I know there's church people here, but. This attitude of we know best and what, what you think and what the rest of the world thinks doesn't matter. Uh, just so irritating. But I also learned other things afterwards about how sometimes it works in the clerical world. And that was that what we hadn't known on the commission was that four or five of the clerical members of the, of the so not commission, committee, four or five of the clerical members were meeting out with the general meeting secretly, deciding what they wanted to be agreed by the group, and then going back and individually supporting a particular position. Um, it was a very unhealthy process. I did some more work with the church in, in that I gave talks to seminarians, and then I took part with some other survivors in writing a liturgy of lament and uh, repentance, which was held in the Pro Cathedral in 2011 in Dublin under Archbishop Martin. And he used the liturgy that we wrote word for word. And it was pretty hard on the church, but he, he did it exactly as, as we had written it. Then I was asked to speak at the symposium in Rome uh, in 2012, the Pontifical Gregorian University, just about the, the, um, about the experience of being a, being a survivor and how it affects your life. I think I'm going on too long, I'm sorry. Anyway. <laughs> I, 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 I spoke at this symposium, it was to the bishops from around the world, the congregation leaders from around the world, and it was just explaining how being abused as a child 
changes the whole view of yourself, how you become, you've no worth, you've no value, you lose your confidence, you lose your trust, and how it affects years of your life. It's not something that, oh, just a child, they'll forget. And I, I took part in that because, again, I felt for the same reason, if even, even one of these men learns something, goes back to his diocese and puts in proper child protection, then some children will be protected who would otherwise not have been protected. But came under huge... Uh, criticism for it by some survivor groups who told me I was uh, colluding with the church, betraying survivors, etc. But that, to me, it's more important that we save children from abuse than worry about um, how angry other people are because you're trying. When the, the Pontifical Commission for the uh, Protection of Minors was announced in December 2013, uh, I was pleased but had no idea I was going to be on it. I had ideas who should be on it. But then it, it, um, I did get the call uh, to, be a, to accept the appointment. I asked how independent it would be, um, who else would be on it, etc., etc., before I said yes. At this point, I just want to tell you a little about the commission. One thing is, it does, it's not a commission of inquiry. A lot <coughs> of people thought it was like a lot of the commissions was going to look into old cases and investigate cases. It doesn't. Uh, it's completely to um, advise on future child protection. It's not there to investigate past cases. One of the very important things is the commission is directly responsible to the Pope. This is quite unique in the Vatican because everyone was within the bureaucracy. Uh, and responsible to other areas first. But we are responsible directly to the Pope, and it's a great advantage to us. The first eight people um, we met in May 2014. Um, we were set the task of deciding ourselves what, what we thought was needed to be looked at, what changes were needed, how we would go about our work, if we wanted to be involved with other departments of the Vatican, or whatever. Everything was up to us. There was no one setting our agenda. We were free to set our, this came from the Holy Father, we were agreed to set the eight of us and we were also the ones to choose whoever else was to join the commission later. So it wasn't a question of going in and being handed a list of do's and don'ts and what you have to do. We sat down the first day with blank pages and decided ourselves. These are the members, the original eight members. There's Catherine Bonnet from France, a child psychiatrist, for many, many years. Uh, myself, as you can see there. Um, Professor Sheila Hollins from England. She's a psychiatrist also, but her speciality is um, vulnerable adults, learning difficulties, etc. Cardinal O'Malley, who you know. Uh, Dr. Claudio Papale, who's a lay married man, canon lawyer, and civil lawyer, who works in, in Rome. Uh, Hannah, I can never pronounce the name, but it's, I think it's Shukwa. Uh, uh, who is a professor of constitutional law. She was also prime minister of Poland after Lech Walesa, and she was foreign, uh, I think she was foreign minister of Poland uh, so she's a very accomplished lady, but her speciality would be civil and international law. Uh, Reverend, Reverend um, Yanez is a moral theologian from Argentina, and he was a pupil of the Pope's. Um, Hans Zollner, he is a psychologist, works at the Pontifical University, and he was one of the people who set up uh, the symposium two years before, the first symposium that the church did on, on abuse. Um, the decisions we had to make were to write our own statutes, the rules by which we would work, the structure of the work, the position in relation to Vatican departments, the issues, the issues we wanted to address, and recommendations for future members. And one of the most important ones of those, certainly for me, was the third one the position in relation to other Vatican departments. There were suggestions that we might work with the CDF, say, for example, um, uh, work with them, maybe have our offices in their building, etc., etc. Um, but we decided 
While we wanted to and would have to cooperate with all the curial departments, we did not want to be part of or under the control of any department of the Vatican. Um, we needed to be able to work completely independently. Yes, we would need to look to various departments for information, for data, things like that. But the one thing we did not want to do was be under the control of any of the curial departments. My view on this is <clears throat> these departments have been dealing with this issue for many, many years and have made a shambles of it and have, have, have not dealt with it properly. So why would you want to be involved or be part of one of those departments? Um, the whole idea was to bring in people with fresh eyes, different uh, experiences, different skills, to look at it completely fresh. You didn't want to become part of what was already there and had already been dysfunctional. That, that would have been how I would have looked at it. And, and others on the commission, not just me. Um, we had three meetings in 2014. Uh, we decided on a working group structure. This wasn't put to us, suggested to us. We worked on it ourselves. We decided this is the way we would do it. I'll explain a little bit more about it in a minute. We decided on the independence from the dicasteries. Probably not a very popular uh, de decision in the bureaucracy in the Vatican, but they had no say in it. Um, we, we identified new members. We wanted people, we, most of the people in the original eight were European, so we needed to get people representing different parts of the globe and also any skills and experiences that were not represented already. Um, we facilitated a meeting for six survivors with the Holy Father last July, and we proposed our first, uh, approved our first proposal, which was on accountability to the Holy Father and is still with him. Uh, in July, our secretary was appointed, and uh, he's from the Boston Diocese. Some people may be familiar with Monsignor Bob. He was uh, the promoter of justice in the CDF for a couple of years, but he is now secretary of the commission. Um, this is the full group. We had our first meeting in February this year, and um, it's the final group. There will be no more members added. There are now 17 members, and that's the total number. Um, and I'll give you now the new members. Columbia, Professor of Psychology. This is Father Luis, Luis um, Manuel Alherrera. He's a professor of psychology, and he's from Colombia, so he's South, South America. Um, Dr. Gabriel Delico from the Philippines. He's a lay member, family, psychotherapist. He also works with perpetrators. It was important that we also had representation of someone who worked with perpetrators. There's no way you can deal with abuse and ignore perpetrators. Um, Bill Kilgallen for, is from New Zealand. He was head of the National Safeguarding Board there, and prior to that, he'd been head of the National Safeguarding Board in England. Sister Kalula Lesa is from Zambia, and she has a lot of experience on the ground in Zambia. Uh, Sister Herm Hermanigold Makoro from Zimbabwe. She's Secretary General of the Bishops' Conference in South Africa. And we really need the buy-in from the African bishops because the problem there is they don't believe there is a problem. <laughs> and until you can convince them there's a problem, they are not going to put in proper child protection uh, policies, nor are they going to look for survivors to help. Um, survivors are not coming forward. Uh, and they don't believe they ever will, but of course they will, and they're going to learn that eventually. Kathleen McCormick is from Australia, and she has worked, as you can see, uh, with the um, Catholic Care Services in Australia. You can see there's a much wider divergence of, uh, of countries involved. And as we know, Australia has had their problems too. Uh, there's Peter Saunders from England. We felt it was very important. We have a male survivor as well as a female survivor. And then Dr. Kristen Wintergreen, who I think you may be familiar with here in Boston. I think she worked in the Boston Diocese. Um, this was the summary in the end. Six lay women, two religious sisters, four lay men, four priests, and a cardinal. We worked very hard to keep the gender balance and to keep the lay religious clerical balance because it's very, very important. 
we felt um, it was very, very important. I don't suppose I'm giving away anything too secret to say it was the lay members <laughs> who wanted to keep the balance. <laughs> <laughs> Particularly the female lay members. Um, so this is the, this is the geographical uh, spread now of the members. Uh, and as far as possible, I mean, you can't, unless you make uh, the commission 30 or 40 strong, you can't cover any, everywhere. But uh, as far as possible, we have representations from the different continents, at least. And these, these are just a summary of the skills and experience represented on the commission. Um, so you have theology, psych child psychiatry, constitutional law. I forgot to say, uh, one of the, the priests um, earlier uh, deals with formation and seminaries. He works in, in seminary area. Uh, you have human rights, human development, canon law, vulnerable survivor advocacy, civil law, perpetrator care, psychology, pastoral psychology, safeguarding, pastoral care, church leadership, forensic assessment, and different cultural uh, perspectives, and the diocesan experience of dealing with the abuse crisis. Who would be Colin O'Malley, really? Um, but each one of the people, there's sometimes on the commission, there's more than one person who had a, would have experience in an area. Um, there's, it's not just one person for each. Some would have experience in different areas, but all those areas are covered by the membership. Uh, which I think is a fairly wide uh, level of experience in early areas. And obviously, um, the, the, the psychiatry and, that, and the pastoral care, it's in the survivor abuse area that they have the experience. Um, now, the commission decided to have working groups. I was speaking to someone just before I started, and it was suggested maybe that we were split into working groups. We weren't. We decided ourselves, the task is too big for 17 people to work on every issue. So we decided to set up working groups, and we at the moment have 10 working groups. We decided the principal priorities that needed to be looked at and worked on, and we set up 10 working groups. And we decided that each working group would have a leader who would be a member of the commission. And each member of the commission could lead one group and be a member of two other groups. Again, to spread the skills, because skills wouldn't necessarily only be appropriate to one group. They might be appropriate to more than one. <clears throat> and this was decided by the commission members we decided which group we wanted to be a member of. We decided which group we would like to lead. It was not imposed by any Vatican, Mandarin, or outside force. We as a commission sat down, went through everything, and made our own decisions as to which groups we wanted to be on, which groups we thought we would be most appropriate to lead. As well as the members of the group, there's no limit on how many members that can be in a group. But we also need, each group will need to bring in other experts, because they won't have the full experience with just the commission members. So we would bring in <clears throat> collaborators, invite people in with skills we need on that group, with maybe local knowledge we need on that group. And they will join the working group, be part of the working group, but they won't be part of the commission. They won't be commission members, but they will be working group members. And again, the invitation for someone to join a working group will come from the working group. It will be approved by the commission, um, but it will come from the working group. Again, it will not have to be approved by any Vatican department or secretariat or anything else. Um, this is, sorry, this is really how it works. You have the commission, the working group with members from the commission leading it and with members of the commission on it and then expert collaborators brought in and then the local church. The idea is that people like yourselves will be asked to send your ideas, your proposals to the group that's appropriate to 
whatever your interest is. You might have something which be, would be of value to more than one of the working groups. This is still all being developed, but there will be a place um, where it will probably be a website where you'll be invited to send in papers which uh, will go to the appropriate working group to input into the work. And that's very important because it's important it comes from the grassroots uh, rather than just top down. Some of the working groups we have, obviously an important one is on the accountability. Um, this is really a, a canon law working group um, where changes have to be made if, if, if bishops can be made accountable, or not just bishops, other church leaders. Formation, a working group that's going to look and research formation, what's happening in seminaries. Uh, from the different points of view, from the point of view of people coming in, are they being properly vetted, and also from the point of view of education and child protection, etc. Um, education for those in church leadership, this is a group I'm a member of. And that is from the curia down, and the Pope has approved this, much, I think, probably to the surprise of the curia. But we have, uh, and this is another proposal that went to the Pope and he approved it, that we will be doing education seminars, talks, for everybody, including members of the Vatican Curia, no matter how high. Um, and it, but it will also go down to uh, country levels as well. Um, again, it's been worked on, but that's the proposal at the moment. And that is so that <clears throat> there's a proper understanding of what child abuse is and what proper child protection is. And we want to have a survivor involved in all that training. It won't be me <clears throat> or Peter or whoever, but we will have a survivor. And this is where having a survivor on the commission is important because it was the survivors on the commission I mean, immediately this came up. Well, you have to have a survivor involved in that. And um, it's not necessarily the first thought that the maybe clerical members may have had. So it's part of being involved and, and giving the survivor viewpoint. It's something that will take time. We also have um, decided that every bishop, everyone who's appointed a bishop, has to go to Rome for two weeks to do an induction type of training course. <laughs> It's actually called, they actually refer to them as baby bishops. <laughs> but the baby bishop course will now have a child protection um, unit in it, a uh, module. Um, and that's coming from the commission. So it may seem the commission is doing nothing. We've been there, what have they done? You know, nearly two years now and we haven't seen a thing. But actually things have been decided, things are happening. It may not be visible on the outside, but, but they, they are happening. Um, obviously, we have a guidelines group, and that's the biggest group. That's the group that's going to have to work on the policies. Uh, we had <clears throat> most of the policies from around the world were called in to be looked at. So we have to, I'm on that group, that's another group I'm on. Um, we have to look at all the guidelines, decide the weaknesses, and come up with what is absolutely needed in every, every child protection policy. And while it has been looked at at the moment by the CDF, they've only looked at it from their perspective. It will now be looked at it from the perspective of psychologists, psychiatrists, uh, survivors. So all these other perspectives will be looked at. And what, where they not, may not see a weakness, we might see a weakness. So this is the point of the guidelines group. Um, there's a group of um, survivor issues, that, that's the one I lead, um, and, and we are really open to decide ourselves what we want to look at. We're only in the, at the point of doing that now, but I would think we would probably look at um, so many issues, you know, the, the, the abuse of uh, legal, civil system, can that be replaced? What can we put in its, its place? Uh, there are so many people who are not satisfied with the way they've been dealt with, um, uh, that they're not happy with the way their dealt, case has been dealt with legally or, uh, sorry, locally or, or at, at uh, Vatican level um, and there's nowhere to go after that. Well, we have to look at some way of seeing can we set up something where we can go after that, maybe a more independent body. Um, 
healing, pastoral care, and we will feed into the guidelines body. This is the whole point, cross-fertilization. Any of the working groups can come up with something. We might come up with something that we feel should be put into guidelines, mm -hmm. and we pass that then to the guideline group. That, that's the idea. Um, monitoring of offenders, this is another, obviously another group, uh, the psychological path through care and monitoring of offenders, which is very patchy, as we know, it depends very much on a local area. The day of prayer was a simple one. A Canadian survivor asked us, um, could we have a day of prayer every year for survivors of abuse? Not just clerical abuse, abuse. And uh, the Pope approved that straight away. And that's the liturgy for that is being worked on. Um, and that, as I say, was a fairly straightforward one. And a survivor group, I think here in the States, uh, went ballistic about it because we were, we were proposing this. We didn't go public on the fact that it was a survivor's idea. So, you know, survivors differ and, and not everyone thinks the same. Mm -hmm. It will help those survivors who feel it will be healing. For those who don't, they don't have to take part. Um, this is the sort of thing the guidelines working group will do. We'll research the documents. We'll get input from the national bodies and local, local church, local um, areas. Um, I've gone through that a bit quick, but I hope you've got an idea of what the commission is doing and how we're doing it or how we're hoping to do it. Um, now, uh, a little bit, I'm, I'm running over time. I'll go as fast as I can speed up. Um, uh, just a little thing about the pluses and minuses. It's all been very slow. Things are done at, at glacial pace in the Vatican. Nothing happens quickly. And they don't see any problem with that. Uh, <laughs> We've taken 18 months to write our statutes, and we were told, we think that's taking forever. And we've been told, well, another, another commission took 13 years, you know. <laughs> so, like you say, yes. Um, so things are slow, and they could be a lot, a lot quicker. Um, there is also some tensions, obviously, between the lay members and the, the clerical members, in that everyone thinks differently, and, and there's a, the, some, some of the feeling is, well, we've always done it this way, do we really need to change, etc. But we are, it's a teething process, and we are getting there. The one thing I would say positively is everybody on that commission is dedicated to improving child protection. There's nobody there just because there's somebody. Everybody was picked for a good reason. Um, I had a lot of doubts about going onto it again, the thing of are you just colluding with a, a PR exercise, etc. Um, if at the end of the day it turns out that we don't get uh, what we want and, and need put in place, I walk away and I will say, I tried, we tried. If the powers that be have not implemented what we've suggested, or well, we did what we could, and I, I won't regret it. Um, there are difficulties in the Vatican. There is resistance to change. Yes, I don't think that's a surprise to anybody. Uh, the, the Holy Father has problems, obviously, with uh, he's making a lot of reforms, and uh, that, that's extremely difficult for him. Uh, I think my main worry about the commission is if anything happened to, to Francis, because he is very much behind it and he is very much a, a strong man. I, if there's time, I'll tell that little story. With, yeah. uh, I, I just told a little story last night, which I think is sort of just an anecdote which gives an idea of the man himself. He, as we know, is a highly intelligent man, and, and uh, I think the fact that he lives in, in Doma Santa Marta and he eats in the big dining room and everyone's passing through, is, is a wonderful move in that he can't be isolated. Nobody can prevent him from uh, hearing things or being told things, etc. But just something about the man himself. I sat with one of the survivors last July as they met with him, and he met in, them in the little TV room, just himself, the interpreter, survivor, and if the survivor wanted to support. There wasn't any massive... Um, uh, 
frills and, and, and uh, things around it. But normally the, the Pope gives a, a set of rosary beads to any one who has an audience with him. And after about the third person had come in, he suddenly re realized he hadn't got the rosary beads and the three survivors had gone off without them. And he just said, just a minute. And off he, he went, crossed the lobby, into the lift, upstairs, to his room, came back down, little bag of rosary beads. Um, and everyone got their rosary beads. But it was just the fact that he didn't send somebody else. <laughs> he just toddled off, got them himself. So the thing about the, and, and you see him in the dining room there, he's serving himself. He doesn't have, have people sort of waiting on him. Even when he moved in first, they, um, everyone used to stand up when he came into the dining room and he put a stop to that. So I would say just from having seen him, I do feel he is sincere. I do feel he does want to see change in the child protection uh, area. And he does want to see uh, what we've had in the past not happen again. Now, we all know there are instances we can't understand, such as bishops in Kansas and all the other things that are happening. Uh, and we wonder why the Pope doesn't do anything about it. Um, I myself was in Rome last week trying to see that happen, something does happen in, in Chile. It's not as easy as just the Pope doing something. He does have the power to do it, but there are other uh, factions working in a different direction. So he doesn't have an easy job. Um, and all I can say is, at this moment, I believe he's very sincere and he's trying his best, but I do feel he has a very difficult job. And I hope for the future that um, he's with us for a while to see all his changes through. Um, one thing I would say on a negative side with the Commission, we have not yet got any funding, proper funding. And uh, without funding, you can't do the work. Without resources, you can't do the work. They're talking about us fundraising, etc. But I mean, if there is a real commitment to child protection being the absolute priority for the church, then we should be getting our funding and there shouldn't be any delay about it. We should have had it by now because you can, you can stymie an organization by starving them of funds. And I think we have got to, the commission has got to be properly funded and soon. Um, I, I, I'm running late, so I'll just finish now. Um, I've no regrets at all at working with the church. Uh, it's never been comfortable, it's never easy. I am now practicing Catholic again, and um, I'm happy to be back in the family. Um, but it still sometimes is difficult. Uh, and what I'd say about being within the commission and all these other things is you can only speak the truth. Uh, you can't make others listen and hear. It. But for the sake of children's lives in the future, and the healing of survivors, we've got to try. Um, I want to thank Voice of the Faithful for the work you do on the ground. Uh, it's a great example of how Catholics can remain in the church despite all that has happened and, and make positive contribution. And finally, what I'd like to say is that I agree with, with your, your basic premise is that we should all keep the faith and change the church. Why don't we go stay here and ask okay. a couple of yeah. questions? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marie.